I have chosen indeed a very complicated and long title for my topic. And that's why I have first to thank you for being here and not being afraid by it. Um, invited by distinguished filmmakers, I should have chosen a much shorter and funnier one. Uh, I mean, The Waterer Watered. You know maybe this, this film. Known as the first film comedy in the history of films, it would have expressed my aim much better indeed. You remember the scene? It portrays a simple practical joke in which a gardener is tormented by a boy who steps on the hose that the gardener is using to water his plants, cutting off the water flow. When the gardener tilts the nozzle up to inspect it, the boy releases the hose, causing the water to spray him. I have now to explain to you why, working on the case of the world milieu, I feel myself in the role of the gardener. Milieu is not just a simple object for a historian of science. It is a tool as well. In French, milieu is very often used by historians, sociologists, anthropologists to contextualize the actors they study. That is why working on the transnational and transdisciplinary history of milieu requires to think about what means writing history how to deal with it as a simple object without taking position about the relevance of milieu as a historiographical category to write this history of the usages of the world of milieu. Is the right history of milieu a mythological one? The question is not so easy to answer. It is even more difficult as nowadays milieu and mythology are praised expressions by postmodern thinkers in France and abroad. In other words, by analyzing the history of the usages of the world of milieu, the historian of science, and especially of human sciences, is faced by a challenge. As historian of science, our main work is to historize the production of human or social scientists. That's why a consistent historical project should have in mind that his purpose is as well historically situated as his objects. Many regret this fact. In my point of view, this infinite regress is not a weakness, but rather a strength. It allows the reader of this type of history to get distance to it and allows him to be able to criticize it. In this way, history keeps distance to ideology. There is a second reason why I have been extremely interested by a transnational and transdisciplinary history of the world milieu. Transnational history is nowadays a flourishing field of research. In the last 10 years, history of concepts has been impacted by, his, by this historiographical turn. It lays much more focus than before on problems of transnational and transcultural re of concepts. The emergence and success of new expressions like traveling concepts, nomadic concepts are a good indicator of this situation. I think that the case of milieu allows to go a step further in this direction. But first I have to precise one point. I distinguish very strongly transnational history from comparative history. For me, one of the problems raised by comparative history is to presuppose that there are comparable situations in different countries, that there are equivalents. But my practice of what I call historical semantics is that we cannot take as given that there are comparable or equivalent situations. The language is a good key to understand that. Since Ferdinand de Saussure, we are aware that mouton in French has not the same value than mutton in English. The second one refers to sheep meat, not to the animal. In French, mouton or agneau refers to the animal as well as to the meat. In the case of milieu, I have been aware of this problem thanks to the use of quotation marks when the word was used in German at the beginning of the 20th century. That is why I decided not to presuppose any equivalence of milieu in different European languages but to follow the travels of milieu from the mid-19th century France to nowadays 
and to note and try to explain its trans transcultural and transdisciplinary resemantizations. What I call transnational historical semantics is also different from what is usually called history of concepts. Indeed, by working on the term of milieu, I discovered that it had been sometimes treated as a single word, a concept, or a theory. By presupposing a, pri a priori distinctions between word and concepts, the Kozelikian history of concepts, for example, doesn't allow to see that. Instead of taking its nature, status, nationality, and so on, as granted, a transnational historical semantic investigation should analyze the terminological and national status given to the objects of investigation by the term's users. Last but not least, traveling from history of literature to biology and sociology to philosophy and now to biology back, Milieu offers a very nice opportunity to think about the process of cross-disciplinary resemantizations. But my introduction is becoming too long and I have to go back to my topic, milieu. I won't present an exhaustive history of the usages of milieu and won't look for its origins. Historical semantics, in my view, has nothing to do with etymology. Etymology presupposes that the original meaning is the right one, the pure one, and that history is the history of its becoming impure. That's why I prefer to begin in medias res, in the middle of the plot, where my first question raised, I mean the distance to milieu in Germany at the end of the 19th century. <coughs> Between 1870 and 1960, approximately, the term milieu frightened the majority of German academics. To understand this historical fact, let us put aside the actual English use of the word milieu. Nowadays, it refers to specific social environments characterized by high culture. In the 1940s, the professor of Romance Philology at Johns Hopkins University, Leo Spitzer, wrote a long essay on the historical semantics of milieu, which can also be, also be considered to be a good example of the German fear of it. Indeed, during World War II, the Jewish Wiener Born and after 1933 exiled Romanists did not simply publish a lexicographical essay, but rather wrote an article conveying deep civil, civiliza civilizational values. There is indeed no axiological ne neutrality within it. It is written entirely as a tribute to the Greek, Greek term periegon, the, the surrounding, literally, and the Roman term ambiance, while symmetrically it is also a criticism of the French term milieu. Here you can see in the quotation. In the context of World War II, Spitzer reassesses the more than 100 year old criticism of the so-called Franco-British natural rights theory as developed by the historical schools that arose in the German territories after Napoleon's defeat. Against this, and in his eyes against typically French and British abstraction and imperialism, he praises the warm abstraction, the organic connotation, and the protective dimension of Perrecon. In fact, German philhellenism which inevitably reminds the reader of Winkelmann, Goethe and their followers, is recalled by Spitzer to justify a cartography of thought that had prevailed for at least a century. On the one hand, the French and British imperialists, the heirs of the Romans, who had no true equivalent of Periacon, and on the other hand, the German Kulturvolk as a modern incarnation of Greek citizens. As a matter of fact, the modern brand of fatalistic determinism envisaged as a menacing force is not a general characterization. It describes in particular the Tenian theory of milieu, as Spitzer call it, calls it, and its evident importance in the history of language and thought. Here in this quotation, the noun aggregate and the verb determine 
are clearly chosen in opposition to the holistic connotations of Spitzer's interpretation of the term Bergen. Leo Spitzer's article narrates the history of the sinking into oblivion of the protective and harmonious connotations of Bergen and the emergence of a deterministic conception of milieu. Spitzer represents the step uh, from biology to sociology as inevitable when we consider the general tendency of the times, the belief that the physical, the biological must be the basis for the complete study of man. For Spitzer, if Kant maintained an idea of a harmony between l'être vivant et le milieu correspondant, then was unable to see in nature anything else but the forces conditioning human life. For Spitzer, there is no doubt, uh, indeed, what he calls the milieu theory is the child of the French philosopher, writer and critic Hippolyte Taine. He introduced the idea in his Histoire de la littérature anglaise, published in 1863. Let us go back to it in order to understand first Taine's goals in, the, in this book and second, the reappropriation and re of his manifesto in Germany. Before using it as the introduction to the first volume of his Histoire de la littérature anglaise, Ten first published the text in which he promotes milieu as one of the three main forces determining history as a separate article entitled L'histoire, son présent et son avenir. At first sight, this introduction could be read as a pure art historical theoretical text. In reality, it was part of the controversy that took place in the 1860s between the positivists and the spiritualists. In March 1863, the positivist freethinker Émile Littré failed to be elected a member of the Académie Française because the Bishop of Orléans, Félix Dupanlou, denounced him as the head of the French materialist and atheist in his Avertissement à la jeunesse et aux pères de famille sur les attaques dirigées contre la religion par quelques écrivains de nos jours. Dupanlou also targeted the historian of religion Ernest Renan and Hippolyte Taine. He accused them of belonging to the same materialist group as Littré and treated them as immoral. Taine's introduction was an answer to Dupanlou. In this text, he quoted Emile Zola's formula that vice and virtue are products like vitriol and sugar in order to suggest that literature and morals were scientific objects like any others. The race milieu moment tri tried is presented by Ten as the result of a deep transformation of the historical sciences. In this, he attributes to Germany the first role History has been transformed within 100 years in Germany, within 60 years in France, and that by the study of their literatures. It was perceived that a literary work is not a mere individual play of imagination, the isolated caprice of an excited brain, but a transcript of contemporary manners, a manifestation of a certain kind of mind. It was concluded that we might recover from the monuments of literature a knowledge of the manner in which men thought and felt centuries ago. The attempt was made and it succeeded. This Germanic flavor was reinforced, reinforced by the fact that Taine's article had been published in the Revue Germanique et Française. However, after this introductory sentence, by detailing the two steps characterizing these ten changes, then stressed their European dimensions. The first step consists of considering historical documents as hints allowing the reconstruction of man as a living being. The heroes of this first step were German, British and French, Gottfried Lessing, Walter Scott, François René de Chateaubriand, Augustin Thierry and Jules Michelet. The second step goes deeper. It looks for the invisible man under the visible one. For ten, this underworld, monde souterrain, is the specific object of the historian. His ta 
task is one of divination. But after this st second step, Ten considered that the historian has to engage in real psychology and not just collect data. The state and the actions of the inner and invisible man have their causes in certain general ways of thought and feeling. Taint thinks that beyond their diversity, all civilizations derive from a few elementary psycho psychological forms. Three different sources produce this elementary moral state. La race, le milieu, le moment. By ra race, he means innate and hereditary dispositions, qualities that are different from folk to folk. But the status of race remains complicated. Ten compares human races with animal varieties, characterizes race as an original model, a primitive stamp, and a, as primordial marks. Yet, at the same time, he considers the races to be the work of a great many ages, perhaps of several myriads of centuries, in short, are the result of a very long history. Races are here synonymous with character and temperaments. After that, we have the milieu as a secondary factor. It explains the differentiation of various peoples belonging to the same race. For example, the deep difference between the Germanic, the Greek and the Latin peoples. Milieu is characterized as physical or social circumstances and as the most important force. Ten considers how three different factors may have a role in the explanation of such differences. The climate, the political circumstances and the social conditions. And the last term, moment, is the last, and Ten characterizes moment thanks to his physicalist vocabulary as la vitesse acquise, acquired momentum. Borrowed from physics, this expression gives history its internal dynamic and explains what he considers to be its development and decline. And that's why he concludes that history has to become une mécanique psychologique. Now, let's go to um, to Germany. Leopold Katscher, a Hungarian Jew and the most important translator of Ten into German between 1877 and the beginning of the 20th century, lamented the slow appropriation of Ten's works in Germany due to the fact that her translations were so late. The second char characterization of the German importation of Taine's work lies, for him, in the fact that his race milieu moment triad was recast in terms of a milieu theory and that its anonymity was an open secret. Indeed, its other name was Tenian theory. Perhaps the best example is the first dissertation in German that includes milieu in, his ti in its title which focuses on Ten, the Théorie des Milieux, written by Eugénie Dutois and published in 1899. And it is astonishing to see how she summarizes what she calls Ten's milieu theory. She says, Ten's system, in order to explain great men, consists of saying that they are the result of only two factors, the faculté maîtresse and the milieu ambiant. With that, he builds up history and psych psychology, politics and morals. With that, he explains evolutions and revolutions. With that, he solved the most difficult problems, as if they were simple arithmetic examples. Ten three faculty maîtresse become one, and milieu renamed milieu ambiant is not presented anymore as a faculty maîtresse. We have to know that Dutois was a student of one of the few promoters of sociology in the German-speaking world, Ludwig Stein, again a Hungarian Jew, at Bern University. At that time, sociology was mostly rejected. It appeared to be a positivist, French and socialist science. This fact contributes to explain why, in a world where Ten and Milieu theory were viewed so poorly, they were not completely rejected by her. 
but even Dutois criticizes in her dissertation 10. The fact that there is a consensus about the origin of milieu in German, the so-called Tenian theory, is particularly important to my own theoretical purposes. Indeed, one of the problems of the Kozelikian history of concepts lies in the fact that it takes for granted the status of what it studies, concepts, and that it defends an a priori and historical distinction between words and concepts. But milieu has sometimes been treated, as I said, as concept and sometimes as a theory, as we saw. In a letter to Katcher, Ten is much more modest indeed. He says, what kept me mostly busy during my life is the development of two or three main ideas. These ideas are set out in the preface of the Histoire de la littérature anglaise, and he finished. I have picked up two ideas which appeared to me as rather curious and which were lying on the floor, forgotten in France, in France at least, since Montesquieu and Condillac. The various lexicographical studies all stress the point that the spread of the French world milieu in the German language that took place from the 1870s onward was directly linked with importing Tenian works. Milieu is thus conceived as a deterministic force that man cannot es escape. Even Leopold Kacher, his translator, who does not translate milieu as milieu but as sphere, is nevertheless very critical about what he calls tense methode. He characterizes it not very positively as a conglomerate Hegel, Herder, Montesquieu, Condillac, Darwin, Spinoza, Tenscher, Theoreme, and summarizes his point by saying that for ten, the human is its unconscious result. As with a lot of tense German adversaries, and more generally, a lot of the critics of the positivists methodology in the Geisteswissenschaften, Katcher rejects the violence which, with which the French author treats his sources. The case of Nietzsche me. is especially representative of the dominant criticism of milieu theory. Nietzsche bought the German translation of Tense Histoire de la littérature anglaise soon after its publication. Along with the vast majority of German academics, Nietzsche rejected positivism. The specificity of his criticism lies in his interpretation of it as a product of the ins instinct of weakness. However, he does not treat Ten as a mere positivist. In his correspondence with him, praise predominates. But what he constantly criticizes in Ten's milieu theory Exactly, that's the point for him. In 1888, in his Götzendämmerung, Twilight of the Idols, in the same part in which he criticizes French and English sociology and sociologism as effects of décadence, Nietzsche defines his concept of genius and rejects milieu theory at the same title. At the same time, excuse me. Nietzsche defends the autonomy of the genius against any contextual explanation of his actions. The milieu theory seems to be, at least at the time and for him, the most paradigmatic representation of this decadent way of thought. Moreover, it has a place of birth and of success, France. Milieu theory was generally understood in Franciac Germany as a flag of determinism and a symptom of democracy made in France. This was an era when the rise of the natural sciences and dots about the relevance of the classical gymnasium were generally considered by German mandarins to be frightening and linked events, and the milieu theory appeared to be a paradigmatic expression of this trend. However, there is a third and final characteristic which explains Nietzsche's ressentiment of milieu theory. At the time, the accusation of determinism was read as a political criticism, as a sign of a socialist, socialist theory. Leopold Katcher, in his biographical presentation of Ten, published as an introduction to his translation of the first volume of The Entstehung des Modernen Frankreich, The Origins of Contemporary France, used many events taken from Ten's biography to stress the proximity of 
his intense political positions. Katcher, who had indeed engaged in many peace and workers' social movements, presents himself as a radical. This political connotation of the Tenyon milieu theory became much more important in the 90s. At that time, politics and science began to intertwine for the German mandarins of the Geisteswissenschaften. The Social Democratic Party, becoming the political party with the most votes in Germany, the growth of the natural sciences and the attempt to import their methods to the Geisteswissenschaften, particularly in psychology, were interpreted as linked with the evolution of the political landscape. Max Weber, a friend of uh, Heinrich Rickert, wrote in a letter to Karl Fossler, a Romanist, the sworn enemy of positivism and the instigator of ide idealism in the science of language, strong criticism of milieu, labeling it a horrible expression, der fürchterliche Ausdruck. But such a hostile reaction might also be that of an outsider in the biological field. Indeed, these critical elements appear clear if one follows the emergence of Umwelt as a bi biological term in the works of Jakob von Uxkühl. Biologist and anti-Darwinist, Uxkühl, who had no tenure at that time, defended the reintroduction re of an internal teleology, Bauplan, in biology. Uxkühl's use of Umwelt was in no way a translation of the French milieu, but rather a reaction against the Tenyon milieu theory. He says it explicitly. explicitly. Uxkühl first defines it in a popular article that was conceived as an answer to what he viewed as the impact of French positivism in Germany, the monist movement founded by Ernst Haeckel in 1906. Uxkühl's conflict with Haeckel and what he called the Darwinian machine was driven by existential, moral and political positions. For him, democracy and determinism were expressions of the same idea. His new understanding of biology, symbolized by Umwelt and its stress on the perspectivistic dimension of each Umwelt, is not separable from a political, anti-socialist and anti-democratic project. Only four German book titles contain the word Umwelt before Uxkühl published his Umwelt and Inwe der Tiere, 1909. After that date, there were many more, and this trend rapidly increased. In the 1920s, Umwelt became much more frequent, frequent than milieu. Between 1899, when the first book using milieu as a title keyword was published, and 1942, when Spitzer published his article on the historical semantics of milieu, only 12 books use the term milieu compared to 77 using Umwelt. The term milieu traveled back from Germany to France and from biology to philosophy. The conference held by Georges Canguilhem, <coughs> entitled Le Vivant et Son Milieu, The Living Being and Its Milieu, played a huge role in the re-semantization of the term. At that time, Canguilhem was what we call Inspector General de Philosophie, the person who manages the career of all the philosophy pretenders. He had a huge impact on them, indeed. Gilbert Simondon, Gilles Deleuze, Michel Foucault, Dominique Lecourt, Étienne Balibar, all these persons were very impacted by this article on Le Vivant et son Milieu. In this conference, he rejected strongly the Tenyon milieu as a determinist and politically reactionary term. Against this, he stressed the fruitfulness of Uxkulian Umwelt, 
renamed milieu. The anti-democratic Umwelt becomes, thanks to Canguilhem, the best example of what he searched, a biological philosophy which stresses the irreducibility of life against physical phenomena. The parallel discussion of Umwelt in the phenomenological movement from Husserl till Landgraber and after that till Derrida and the huge reception of this tradition in France after the Second World War, a bit before also but much more after, contributed to make of milieu redefined as a subjective concept and mostly used in plural, les milieux, and not anymore le milieu, a high-priced term in the actual postmodern philosophy. This explains a good part of the French animal turn in philosophy and social sciences, as we call it. In bibliometrical terms, this milieu renaissance is clear. While between 1990 and 1999 there were 25 books which titles used milieu, between 2000 and 2010 we have approximately 100 books in French which used it. Let's conclude briefly. The case of milieu shows that thanks to a transnational historical semantics we may see the re, re of a cross-disciplinary and transnational intellectual vocabulary. From a triad by ten, it became a milieu theory in the German Geisteswissenschaften and biology, was rejected as it and contributed to the re of Umwelt in the frame of a subjective and anti-Darwinist biology. Travelling back to France, it was renamed milieu, mostly in plural, and became a concept. I refer here to the discussion about concepts in Deleuze's work, which used in order to define a philosophy of nature different from the science of nature, seen by these philo philosophers, all the postmodern philosophers, as reductionist and determinist. Thank you for your attention. I'm wondering, uh, what, what, what is after all traveling? Uh, it, is, it is not the concept, as you said, because you, you tried to distinguish yourself from the conceptual his, uh, history of concepts. And it is not, it, it is not um, a relative position, a relative semantic position, as the structuralist uh, could say, uh, because, uh, because it implies some, uh, some comparativism, but, and, and it is not a word. And uh, so, after all, what is traveling in, in the transnational, transnational history of, uh, of milieu? I just want to stress that the re can be, uh, can concern every dimension of what, of this sign, how to call it, which has been uh, imported, exported, translated, and so on. So maybe word is more than what we should use, maybe work vocabulary. It's just at the limit of the express expressibility. The, I just want to stress with that, that uh, we should rather uh, avoid um, not uh, questioning the status of what is traveling. So mm -hmm. maybe it is, a, it is just a question, <laughs> which is a or question mark with it, which, which is traveling. What you said about the Taine's milieu theory reminds me mm -hmm. uh, what Elisée Reclus said, mm -hmm. the relationship between man and nature. Mm -hmm. And do you have some some information of if Reclus was, uh, I don't know, um, not... If there was a link between Ten and Reclus, could be. I've never, never searched so really in this direction. What I could say that we can, 
I, I just uh, gave a few spots in this history, but um, you can see, for example, uh, the pregnancy of these uh, Tenyon's critics uh, in, um, in uh, Lucien Febvre's L'Homme et la Terre, 1922. In his introduction, it is uh, from the beginning to the end a struggle against Ten and the milieu, <laughs> milieu theory. And he uses and he made of Ten a typical representative of German geography <laughs> and of Ratze against uh, whom he praises Vidal de la Blache and the École Française de Géographie. So, but it is all clear, I, I, it's, it's a good point to you, it's a good question to, to look, look for that. Uh, you said that uh, the phenomenologists, French phenomenologists, they used uh, milieu uh, in the plural. And what was the reason why do they, why do they use this, uh, they replaced? The world media without. It goes in the same direction as uh, to stress the perspectivistic dimension of milieu. That means there is uh, so many milieus as there are uh, species or individuals. It depends on what you are looking at. If you are in biology, more species. If you are in uh, philosophy, more individuals. Uh, it's very clear, um, here I, I added this quotation um, from Proust et les which is typical of this use, this plural use of uh, milieu. What is the connection to the German sociologist who discovered or who coined the concept milieu? It depends what you say with coining. If quoting or coining is just uh, without any valuation, um, so I would say first there is uh, we have to write another history of German sociology, what has been done, because the fa the named fathers of sociology. Tunis, Zimmer, Weber, in the uh, common representation, where, except, uh, except Tunis, were all adversaries of the world sociology. They could not use it. When they used it, it was just in order to criticize their adversaries. So, uh, milieu was uh, an avatar or a tool or uh, something which goes with sociology for them and with, uh, which has to be criticized as it as such. Um, milieu became a sociological word or important quasi-concept in Germany after 1945 in the 60s. Uh, there are so many, uh, so many not, but few sociologists, few German sociologists coming back from the United States who said this word of milieu could maybe bring us something. But it was in a way uh, a usage which uh, was an anti-Marxian, anti-Marxist usage. So milieu was the way of making a less deterministic sociology than what happened uh, in the German Democratic Republic, which existed at the time. So it's, it's a, a very good question. It's a complicated history indeed, the appropriation of milieu in the German sociology. I would like to ask you, uh, when you discussed the revival of the term notion mm -hmm. milieu, is there some uh, connection with the discussion on place construction? 
Christian and place in you? Mm -hmm. They're this totally separate? Uh, not totally separate, but rather antinomic, especially in France. When the spe special geography coming in, in from the United States in the 1960s, uh, what we call analyse spatiale, came in France, arrived in France in the 60s, 70s, um, it was to replace this old milieu world which has been praised in the geographical tradition since Vidal de la Blache and which was linked with, uh, with uh, a way of doing dissertations in geography. So, L'homme et le milieu was something like uh, very common and not very questioned at the time. And so, espace became uh, a new reference uh, from the 60s. I have um, made, I have, I have it, I have not, no, no, I think I have no, no graphic here, but I have done this work to uh, study also the, in a bibliometrical way, the geographical dissertations had in France uh, from the 1920s to 2000. And you can see that at around 1970, media disappears and that espace uh, takes its place, its place. And it's a new trend uh, since 10 years approximately that some culturalist geographers like <coughs> Augustin Berck reuse milieu against espace, seen as a much too scientific word uh, to um, in order, but thanks to another travel, which is a travel which goes uh, to Japan and comes back to France because he's a specialist at the beginning of Japanese geographical uh, geography, and Jap Japanese uh, cultural geography. And uh, thanks to this uh, fieldwork, he uses uh, an expression uh, um, which has been uh, created in Japan thanks to the, to the mobilization of Heidegger from Japanese geographers in, at the end of the 1920s, just after Zion on Sight, which is called Fudosei. And he translates Fudosei in médiance, and now he writes a lot about mesology, mesologique, milieu, médiance, and so on. And so for him, milieu, in plural again, is a way to escape from this, um, from this space analysis domination. So it's also another troubling story. You said that you were taking a position against Kozelek and mm -hmm. his, uh, the way he separates words and concepts. Mm -hmm. Could you say a few words about that? Indeed, on, this, on these points, it's not just Kozelek, but a lot of history of concepts who doesn't, who doesn't uh, history of concept, uh, yeah, concept historians, who doesn't uh, really question the, the status of what they call a concept. So they build history of concepts, encyclopedias, but how they, how they select it, why this and not another, uh, that stays very much, not always, but very often um, uns unsaid. Uh, and that's 
the facts for Kozilek, but not just for Kozilek. No, Kozilek, with Kozilek there is another problem, which is um, his di diagnostic on modernity, which is a direct um, remobilization of the Carl Schmitt diagnostic of, on modernity. That means he, he is a student of Carl Schmitt, which, is, which nobody says in France. I have some idea why, but... Um, and for him, the work on the Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe is, um, in a way, uh, um, a manner of uh, testing the plausibility of uh, Schmidt's uh, di diagnostic on modernity. That means this tendency of modernity to tend to axiological neutrality and to, uh, uh, to suppress any decision, political decision, and to try to technicize every political decision or juridical or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And that is and that's why the Zadar site from Kozilek goes between uh, um, is is a period which goes from 1750 and 1850. What is in the middle? The French Revolution. So he re actuates uh, he, he, he is he, he makes he, he, he suggests narrative which uh, is in a way the same narrative than the historicist of the 19th century who says exact who said approximately the same that is we have here um, with the French Revolution the victory of the natural rights theory and against this we have to be historicists so, uh, in the scansion of history in the periodization of history he is an heir of this uh, way of, uh, of uh, seeing the modernity I think I wonder in what category would uh, the Cambridge School of the Analysis of mm -hmm. Meanings um, belong? I mean, what is your um, take on Quentin Skinner's methodology? Skinner is, uh, is a son of Cambridge and uh, of a Cambridge who has read Oxford. And in Oxford you had um, in Cambridge, you had Wittgenstein, and in Oxford, you had Austin. So, um, Skinner is firstly a son of Austin and Wittgenstein's second philosophy. That means, uh, in the center of the analysis is not really the concept, but much more the proposition. Um, that the center of his analysis and of Pocock and, uh, so, and the Cam what we call, usually called, the, called uh, the Cambridge School of Political Theory. Um, it, it is uh, a remobilization in history or in history of ideas or in history, uh, we should see how he calls it. And I think uh, he, he would speak much more from a history of ideas. Um, it is uh, really in in this direction which which we, we could uh, see him. So it is an artifact of the commentators to to make one of uh, Kozilek and uh, Skinner just because you know when when you have to write a, a book on history of concepts you have to have both for selling it so we make one chapter on Kozilek and one chapter on 
Skinner. But uh, they are rather different, rather different, I think. One, one is, uh, and this time is the sociologist in my head who is speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you showed us the statistics of, of, of the of titles using Umwelt and, mm -hmm. uh, and Milieu, and I'm just, I'm just wondering whether you also checked uh, in these in these titles, they refer to the uh, to the umwelt of uh, of Uxkul uh, or or the the umwelt of Dane. Okay. Does it? Uh, so there is no umwelt of Dane. <laughs> or the the milieu of the, so what what I mean is that that uh, after the publication of Uxkul's book, mm -hmm. uh, which has the title umwelt in it, then uh, what I'm asking is whether there are some uh, uh, German scholars who will. Uh, Use this translation of of the term milieu when they when they talk about Dane's work. Of course, that's a first approximation to look at the titles. After that, you have to open the books. That's maybe the problem. Uh, no, um, uh, that's a first step. And after that, you have to look at each one to see what they do, how they manage with it, what they call the term, and. I would say you should also make an inquiry into the um, editing history. So who chose the title? Because everybody who has published a book knows that it's not always the author that chose the book. But for me it's an interesting point to see that uh, and this is a work in progress. So I, I have cho I have chosen a few titles uh, to check, and since now I have uh, it's it's always uh, ten which which is uh, linked with milieu even after 1909 after the publication of um, of uh, Uskul, and often it is a crude critic of them. So maybe you have the, the milieu in the title, but it doesn't mean always that it is a, a praise of them. So, but of course, uh, I have to, to work further on this to, to point uh, what's, what stays uh, what what lies under the expression? That would be the uh, the changing uh, milieu of, of of milieu, and what I mean is that mm. the, your first your first uh, reference well. from it was from the 1860s, and the last one uh, from the 1960s, the uh, the 1950s, uh, uh, Kangia. So it's uh, what I'm asking is, is that in that hundred years, social sciences evolved a lot. So, uh, uh, for example, you. In the 1860s, you don't have the eugenic thought uh, at all, but by the 1950s, it's already it's already after the advent of mm -hmm. of, uh, of mm -hmm. this of this concept. So you it 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 couldn't serve as a some kind of enemy of milieu, uh, so to so to speak. So I'm I'm wondering whether whether you could reflect on the on the on the changing context changing uh, context in the social sciences of 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 this word or of this concept. Yes, of course, the re is uh, intimately linked with the context in which uh, it has, it, it, it is mobilized. Uh, I try to stress this point. Um, for, uh, for Kangilem, milieu is... Uh, is a term which he criticizes from 1930 to 1980. So he's a very good uh, example, a very good case to study the re in the work of one person. That means what he calls milieu in 1930 is not what he calls milieu in 1980, even if, if in 1930 and in 1980 it's always 10 which he quotes. But in 1930 it's 10 because of Paul Bourget and so 
uh, Ankhid Refusa of, that, of the time before 1900. In 1950, when he makes his conference, it's America and behaviorism, which is the main target. And in 1980, it's the neurobiology of Jean-Pierre Changeux and so on and so on. But it's 10 which is quoted. <laughs> so that's interesting because you see that 10 is a, which was a very, I haven't, uh, it's maybe a mistake, but I haven't stressed this point. 10 was a very important reference in the curriculum of the French secondary system from 1900 to 1940. After the Second World War, a bit less. But you have so 40 years uh, during which um, 10 is a uh, a reference, a huge reference, sometimes as a model for in, in, in uh, what the French called at that time les lettres, um, as a scientific model, so in order to make the interpretation of literature scientific, or as a target in philosophy. So, uh, you have it, Kangelem is also a good indicator of what was the um, scholar unconscious of the time in France. So, um, even if he maybe uh, indicates it in a brilliantly way, but even. <laughs>